2022 Jeju Plus International Environment Forum afternoon session will take place from now on. Under the theme of risks of microplastics, recent studies regarding impact on human and ecosystem is going to start. And for every session, we receive questions from YouTube. So please make sure to leave comments or questions 20 minutes before until the 20 minutes before the session. And I will aggregate the question and deliver them to speakers. So I'd like to give the floor to Professor Ko, who is moderating the session. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Professor Chehak Ko of Jeju National University of Environment Engineering Department. So the issue of microplastic and pollution is a global issue. So we are going to talk about its impact. So we need to have a better understanding of microplastics impacts. In that regard, the role of the academia is going to be more important than ever. So under the theme of risks of microplastics, impact on human, e human and ecosystem, we are going to start the session. So we will share research trends in the academia and updates in the field. We have four very distinguished experts and for the discussion session, Associate Professor of Indian Institute of Technology will deliver his remarks. So each presentation will be delivered for 25 minutes and we are going to have a 20 minute discussion after all the presentations end. And we are going to receive questions during the discussion session. We will not receive your question during the presentation session. So the first presentation will be delivered by principal researcher Jong Jin Young of Korea Research Institute of Bioscience and Biotechnology. And currently, he is a professor at Korea Research Institute of Bioscience and Biotechnology. Nanosynthetic and nanoplastic intake and its impact on diseases and microplastics flow are the interest areas of her research. Please, ladies and gentlemen, welcome her with a big hand. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. As was introduced, I'm principal researcher Chong Jin Young of Korean Research Institute of Bioscience and Biotechnology. So, under the theme of plastic and biodiversity, the forum is being held, and it's my great pleasure to receive the invitation. So, microplastics session start with my presentation, so it weighs a little heavy on my mind, but you are very much interested in microplastics, and I'm going to talk about the types and impact of microplastics. So as a first presenter, I'll generally talk about the high-level overview of recent studies on microplastics, and also my institution recently did some research, so let me share some outcome of it as well. Tomorrow, I, I mean yesterday and this morning, we have listened to many plastic-related presentation, and this picture you must have seen already. So the age we are living in is called the plastic age. This is because the plastic we are using is very common. I, I mean, plastic is the most common and materials we are using. In case of stone age, it was stone, and in case of iron age, it was metal. But in case of plastic age, it is plastic, the core material of the modern society. As you already well aware. Plastic has been produced not long ago from 1950s where when the mass production began and it increased exponentially since then and it put that into figures 200 million product was produced in 1950 but now figure increased up to 34 billion jumped from 8.3 billion in 2017 level so such high volume of plastics are generated and consumed, and likewise the plastic waste have increased a lot. It was 6.3 billion in 2015, but it skyrocketed up to 12 uh, twice in 2015. In the morning, we talked about the waste plastic and how to manage it in depth. However, recycling of plastic has not been much done. 80% of the plastic are either in landfill or just disposed into the nature. Actually, plastic is using at every corner of, of our life, but 
Another area that uses uses the plastic much is like the field that produced the mask we're wearing and the things we used much during the COVID-19 days. From 2020, the COVID spread very rapidly, so PPE, personal protective equipment, started to be used very widely and the number of the usage increased exponentially as well. And PPP has been very controversial because most of the PPE are made of the plastic. For example, let's say that wiper or mask or in the lunch, you must, you must have used the hand sanitizing glove, which is also made of the gloves to prevent the contamination of virus. So, due to COVID-19, plastic pollution has been aggravated, and this is another source of huge plastic-induced pollution, and that PPE and plastics is highly likely to affect the human being well-being as well, according to recent studies. So, the great example of PPE, mask, can be a source of microplastics as well, according to the recent prediction. No one knows how much exposure has been made or how much impact will be made with a mask. However, it is clear and obvious that wearing mask and disposal of such waste can go into soils, oceans, or into the air, travel all the way until it finally affects our human beings. Actually, these plastics have been discussed quite a, in depth because those plastics also are source of microplastic or nanoplastics as well. As it was already said in the previous presentation, let me just repeat the gist of it. Microplastic is defined by the plastic whose size is less than 5 millimeter. And another definition I need to add is that if the size is less than 1 micrometer, it is called nanoplastic separately because microplastic and nanoplastics uh, their environmental behavior and accumulation aspects of them are quite different from one another. Not just in size, but shape, but properties are quite different as well. So plastics exposed or disposed into the nature are fragmented, unstructured way. Also in the morning, someone talked about the microfiber induced plastic waste that is used for the detergent, and they are also classified as microplastics as well. Also, properties of the microplastics or materials. Synthetic resin is most common, but polyethylene or polypropylene are often used as well. PS PVC pad are also a common choice of material for plastic product as well. Such plastic I think it was much said in the morning, are used everywhere in our lives. Legally, it is prevented or regulated to use microbees for soap or personal hygiene products. Those microbees and are called primary microplastics are commonly used in our daily lives, but the main component of our clothes is also synthetic resin. That synthetic resin is also a source of microplastic. And also, yesterday, the Korean Environmental Corporation talked about the medical waste, and that medical waste are mostly made of plastics, masks, PPE, those commonly used daily products, medical products, or health products are mostly made of plastics. Also, the soil pollution is recently receiving much attention. Merching induced microplastics are also a source of concern. And inside the fine dust, there are also microplastics as well, coming from the synthetic resin car tires. As such, in many fields, you can find various types of plastic product and waste which generate microplastics in the end. In the past, actually, most of those products were found mostly under water. But recently, these microplastics are starting to be found under soil or inside 
in the air even. So many people like, expect that the concentration of them in the air or in the soil will be very high and that will be accumulated inside the human bodies as well. One other microplastics feature I need to mention is that microplastics when they are exposed to the nature are in, existed in multiple uh, shapes because it observes or it is attached to other materials as well. For example, when microplastics are inside a nature, bacteria, virus, and those microorganisms can attach to such microplastics. And besides microorganisms, biomaterials, gene materials, proteins, biomolecules also can attach to them as well. Also, the overuse of anti uh, agent also can affect the human body by attaching to microplastics as well. So I think those most of the products are not used as a monomer to increase the strength or property of the uh, properties of the micro. I mean, pro plastics additives are much used, which can be also source of another impurity to microplastics. Also. Environmentally toxic agent like PHE can be on other things that can interact with microplastics in the nature. And this will eventually affect mid, um, small size animals inside of their body, according to the recent reports. So you might have another, also have a curiosity about the impact of microplastics on human bodies and how much exposure has been made. From 2019, and the study has been done on the impact of microplastics on human body, one after another. One representative outcome was that uh, one study predicted that the exposure would be made by the digestion of my microplastics. For example, the microplastics inside uh, the oceans will be engulfed by small or large sea animals, and it will go all the way down to into the human body. But recently, the microplastic in the air has been studied and outcome was released. And it turns out that the microplastic in the air can be another exposure that we need to face. And such estimation has been backed by another recent studies. And let me share just two of those studies. Microplastics in the air are exposed to humans. And to confirm the exposure, we need to look into the tissues of human body to detect microplastics. Last year and only this year, such detection was actually made. For example, let's say the, the inside the lung of the human body, there has been a microplastics found in the recent study. Polyethylene, polyethylene, polyamide were detected. Only this year, more detailed analysis was made. Uh, depending on the location of the tissues, lung tissues, the types of the plastics were different and the number were different. For example, the lowest part of the lung, low lung tissue, and most of the tissues inside the lung Polypropylene, polypropylene were found in most of the parts of the lung, and that polypropylene will be explained in the later part of my presentation once again. Another thing we need to pay attention to is the tissue of the pregnant woman or pregnant animal. In 2020, pregnant rat were ingested with the nanoplastic and that nanoplastic went into the lung of the rat. And in multiple organs of the mouse body, microplastics were found. Also, placenta sample were donated to a certain research team. And after staining the polypropylene, it turns out that multiple propylene were found inside the sample placenta as well, which was quite controversial back then. Besides, there are a lot of organs like uh, pancreas and other organs are exposed to microplastics as well. And UNAP recently summarized the level of exposure by organ. The level of microplastics or concentration of it in the air is quite high, so we are very much exposed to microplastics in the air we assumed, and also 
the ingestion of microplastics can also happen through the skins, according to recent estimation. Such microplastics entered into the human bodies can travel all the way through human bodies, including placenta and lung, according to the recent study. If that's the case, those microplastics inside our body or nanoplastics, what effect will they make inside the human body? It is not possible to do the study inside a human body, but instead we looked into the body of small animals. And let me give you some outcomes of it. The biggest impact were found in the oxidization level, active oxidization level. Oxidization stress are induced not by not just by nanoplastics but by other risk factors. So that is very common kind of reaction of any creature's body. When it comes to small animals, it affects the development of the body because of the microplastics. Also, it affects the neural system of the animal, according to the recent study. When uh, plastic consumption is made through ingestion, it affects the metabolism of the body as well, or immune system, or some genetic regulation as well. It has not been much studied, but that kind of immunomodulation aspect of microplastic is studied as well. As I said before, microplastic study has been done in vitro, not, with, not within the human body, but mostly within the animal body. My institution used a jabra fish and did a many study with this common animal for animal testing. Microplastics were fed to this jabra fish because it is commonly used for microplastic study. Development or fertilization, neurotoxicity are studied as well. And let me just give you two examples of that for such study. In 2019, this is a paper re released, and nanoplastic inside the jabra fish are accumulated, especially embryo of the jabra Fish, embryo of zebra fish. If the plastic size is less than 2 nanometer or over 2 nanometer or 2 nanometer, we expose those kind of three ty of types of nanoplastic to zebra fish. And if the size is bigger, the accumulation is bigger as well, it turns out. Nonetheless, the development of zebra fish has been less affected by the size of the plastic waste. However, if you use a microscopic device to look into inside of the small organs or tissues of the small organs, energy-related organ mitochondria was very much affected by the microplastic. Actually, the, the damage was found inside the mitochondria, and that also related to the increase in active oxy oxygen as well. The second one I'd like to share is that actually the previous study was about the polystyrene type plastic. However, the most of the production, consumption, and waste comes from polypropylene or polyethylene. So in case of polypropylene, including disposable product, mask, clothes are common usage. So microplastics amount are expected to be quite huge in quantity. Like I said, microplastics coming from masks are one huge concern according to the recent experiments. These microplastics have been studied, like I said, but nanoplastics are not much studied because of the limitation in analytic methodology or sampling methodology. In case of my institution, Polypropylene or nanoplastics are actually produced inside the lab and observed with the recently developed technology. So expose them to zebra fish to understand the circulation and distribution of nanoplastics inside the body of zebra fish. Not just an embryo phase, but we look into the small fish, baby fish of the zebra fish, and expose the poly polypropylene as well. And we confirmed that through ingestion, the plastic is accumulated inside the zebra fish. And also, we look into the tissues, and most of them were found in stomach of zebra fish. If you see this video clip, you can understand that through the movement of bowel, that nanoplastics are mostly 
executed for like 58 hours since the digestion. Also, toxicity was studied as well. PP nanoplastic, up until certain concentration level, it does not affect the development of the fish or in any other way. So we need to do further molecule level study to further understand the effect of it. Also, through joint research, we published another this study as well. So I'd like to share this as well. This was the study for mouth model. Pregnant mice was eaten with poly nanoplastic embedded food. And what we wanted to know was that after giving birth, whether there would be nanoplastic inside of the baby mouse as well. Mother mouse, of course, were analyzed that there were a lot of nanoplastic inside the organs of the mother mouth, but inside a baby mouth, none were found. However, after giving birth, some nanoplastics actually were found after several days later because mother mouse who eat the plastic embedded food affected the milking organs of the mother mouse and the milk coming from mother were delivered to the baby mouth and the nanoplastic were found inside the brain of the baby mouth. After several years, uh, the baby mouse developed and, look, we, and we analyzed the behaviors and the development of small mouth and it affected the development of the brain of a baby mouth and the cognitive capability as well. So we confirmed that the nanoplastic inside the mother mouse can affect the development and health of baby mouth. Actually, all the studies that I explained so far, microplastics and its effect on human bodies or the body of creatures are just some tip of the iceberg because we don't know uh, what will change, what changes will happen depending on the concentration or types of plastics. Also, quantitative analysis have done in some few cases, but in the long run, the monitoring of nanoplastics and analysis of them should be further done. Also, micro and nanoplastics can interact with other materials, I said. The kind of complex interaction has not been much studied yet. So more study need to be done to fully understand the interaction between microplastics and its effect on bodies of creatures, I believe. And it concludes my presentation. Thank you so much for your kind of listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Jung, for sharing your ideas and presentation. So the definition of microplastics and the flow of them and the toxicity have been covered very well by Dr. Jung. Thank you. Next speaker is going to talk about impact of microplastics on aquatic ecosystems. Professor An Yunju of Gongguk University will deliver her presentation. She is a renowned toxicity researcher, and currently she is a professor at Gongguk University and dean of environmental department. And also, she served as president of Environmental Toxicity Society. And recently, she showed up a TV show called China in Class. So she gave a lecture regarding microplastics. So anyway, please welcome her with a big hand. As I've been introduced, I'm An Yunju from Gongguk University. And so many experts and people have gathered to talk about plastic issues and discuss future directions regarding plastic pollution. I believe it is a good way to do, good way to go, and it is my great honor to be here to present my presentation. And I was introduced as a toxicity researcher. And I have emphasized that I'm a toxicity researcher. And recently, many people have well, have only understood regarding how much plastic we eat. But my research area includes this, but as well as how microplastics have impact 
on living creatures. So this is what I study. So pollutants and creatures in the ecosystem can have interactions and what kind of impacts, usually negative impacts, are delivered. So you may wonder what kind of creatures we are using for research, but to measure toxicity in living creature, we have a limited types and species. So with such limited species, we can carry out research for many and more various species in a quantitative way or in a qualitative way so that we can find out what kind of impacts could be created when microplastics are exposed to living creatures. We need this kind of research because we can diagnose the situation with this. If you get sick, you need to have a correct and right diagnosis so that you can get treated. So to protect the ecosystem, we have talked a lot about protecting ecosystem, but we need to think about what really, what we really need to protect the environment. And we need to think about what kind of impact has been imposed on living creature. So through ecological toxicity, we are going to study and research. So to what extent we need to we need to study to what extent is okay for our living creatures. Microplastics is just one of many pollutants, but it has garnered a lot of attention because on the planet the largest volume uh, microplastics are the largest portion of waste. But if such microplastics, just like other pollutants, are as toxic as other pollutants, then I believe there would be no ecosystem like it is today. But microplastics shows some chronic toxicity rather than immediate toxicity. So that's why when it comes to the ecological toxicity, it's hard to figure out what kind of impact microplastics have on the environment. We are saying we are living in the era of plastics and and plastics are everywhere in our ecosystem. Sometimes I got a question like this. Where is the place that is that has no plastics? And I said nowhere. Indeed air, freshwater, sea and sediments. So microplastics are everywhere in the ecosystem of us. So currently it is a plastic cycle. We can say we sometimes we say water cycle or other cycles, but we can say there is a plastic cycle. And since the 2000 uh, and two years ago, the COVID-19 broke out and still we are not yet at the end of the tunnel. And there is a newly coined term regarding this. And I guess we have seen many newly coined term and masks. We human beings are called homo mascus. It means that human beings wearing masks. And homo plasticus is another newly coined word. It means human beings that cannot live without plastics. So because of the pandemic, plastic issues have been severe and now we are seeing syndemic, synergized pandemics. We have syndemics, pandemics, and we have no idea what kind of newly coined term would be created going forward. In particular, plastic issues and microplastic issues became a domestic issue when we boycotted the, imp the export of plastic waste to China. That's when we started carefully thinking about plastic waste. At the time, we had many colored pet bottles and we had many labels. But now if you look at water bottles, there's no label. We have made progress so far. And indeed from plastic, waste plastics are generated and those plastics are broken into microplastics. And going forward, as time goes by, the issue has become severe, which all citizens are well aware of and in particular even elementary schools are well are well understanding of this issue 
under these circumstances, the issue of plastic, with what kind of perspective should we deal with this? I majored in ecological toxicity, so I looked at microplastics impacts on the aquatic ecosystem. So today I'm going to focus on the aquatic ecosystem. Of course, I also talked a lot about the soil at other forums and conferences, so I'm going to focus on the aquatic ecosystem. While I have studied it, I have seen a lot of plastics in coast, and this is Chuja Island. It's one hour away from Jeju Island on ship. It is very clean island, and I happened to visit this island in 2008, uh, 18. As you can see on this picture, it is Sukjumori coast. You can see there is a spot where a lot of plastic wastes are accumulated and stuck, stacked up. And I landed here and I myself touched some plastic waste. We don't have to blame China and Japan for such plastics. And you can see many plastics worn out. And some plastics are broken into pieces, fragmented. And next is Kumodo Island in Yosu. And you can see many plastic fragments and pieces. These pictures are these pictures are taken by me. You can see low density pro, uh, pro and they are worn out under the exposed under the exposure of shine. If you touch it, then it can crushes. It can crush. Once it is starting to wear out, uh, being be worn out, then the process accelerates. It is Tolsando Island in Yosu. It is a coast named Musulmok. While I was walking, I was seeing plastics and took pictures. So you may think that microplastics are smaller than five nanometers, uh, five millimeters. So you may think that it's visible, but it is not. I touched it, and as you can see, a white dust. I can see the white dust on my finger. So since we, it is visible, so we can think it is the size of micro unit, but if it is scattered, it's hard to see. And if it is fragmented and broken into pieces more, then it can be broken into pieces as small as nano size. So it is called a nanoplastics. And in the ecosystem, there are so many. There, We expect that there are there would be so many nanoplastics, but Still, we don't have any idea regarding nanoplastics because we don't have enough technology methods to measure it. And our lab researched papers regarding microplastics and about microplastics smaller than 300 micrometers affect creatures. Of course, microplastics bigger than that affect the ecosystem, but usually if microplastics become smaller than 300 micrometers, then it hugely affect, they hugely affect the creatures, living creatures. We started the study earlier. In 2017, we started and published the paper first. And the result of the paper was introduced. At the time, we used water flea called Daphnia galeata. It is very commonly found in Korea. So when it comes to ecological toxicity, of course, we can use some foreign species. But the most desirable thing species is uh, the most desirable one is to use species in existing in Korea. So water flea is very abundant in sea. So they can be fed by fish. So it's in the middle of the food chain. So it is very appropriate and highly valuable for species tests. So water flea reproduces. It doesn't lay an egg, but it produces its baby. So it has an egg. So it has an egg pocket. So many contaminants can come uh, go in and outside of this water flea. So micro or nanoplastics were exposed to water flea, and nanoplast we were able to see nanoplastics 
penetrating into water flea and penetrating into the egg pocket so that eggs are exposed to nanoplastics. And we looked at what happened when eggs are exposed to nanoplastics. And eggs exposed to nanoplastic were not able to be hatched. Why? And, and the result of it is that the reduction of the number of water flea, so it means that fish is more likely to be uh, to be born and the ecosystem could be very vulnerable going forward as you can see on the we use some fluorescent materials for research and as you can see this oral flea has some eggs and we took a picture so that we can so that we could find how nanoplastics can be combined with eggs. So it shows that the nanoplastics are interacted with other species. And let's look at the sea. So water fleet lives in fresh water. And in the ocean, there is a Altamia shrimp or brine shrimp. So those brine shrimps were exposed to microplastics. And we saw those brine shrimps grow. And when we when we talk when we talk about the result of paper, if you have enough evidence, then we can say microplastics through the food chain can be transferred. Uh, is transferred. It is a scientific evidence. So we used small yellow croaker. We eat a lot. It is small yellow croaker. So we use them so that we looked at when Art Artemia was exposed to microplastics and small yellow croaker eat such brine shrimps. And we looked at their small yellow croaker. And we found out that microplastics eaten by brine shrimps are transferred to small yellow croaker. So we can expect that if we eat yellow, small yellow croaker, then microplastics would come to come into our body. And we have many studies, we have seen many studies saying that microplastics are inside the human body. And also, microplastics were found in human blood. Indeed, we expected and anticipated, but we had no scientific evidence. And also microplastics were found in placenta. Then where does it come from? Of course, in the air, there is microplastic. And at this studio, there is a huge amount of microplastics floating. And in the ocean, and when we eat food, eat shrimp, eat fish, microplastics can be consumed as well. And other pollutants can be consumed and other heavy metals, we have to eat them without any choice. So it is a very small yellow croaker. So we analyzed it and we found out one point that we need to th think about. So their movement, their moves became narrow when they were exposed to microplastics and they move slower. Of course, exposure to microplastics doesn't lead to a death, immediate death. But if those fishes are exposed to microplastics, they move slow. And it applies for other living creatures as well. The zebra fish and other living creatures showed similar trends. So in other words, when it comes to behavior science, they are undermined. Then what does it mean to our ecosystem? It means that in the ecosystem, living creatures should move fast to eat, and they need to avoid fast when there is a predator. But if they move slow, if, if they move slow and if they are not able to move fast, then they would face difficulties as we face when we get older. So in other words, when it comes to ecology, they are very vulnerable. They would become very vulnerable. 
And let's look at Daphnia Magna again. So I'm going to talk about microfiber. Bioplastics is a hot topic. And new materials for bioplastics have been developed by companies, and those companies are creating product using that. And there are many papers and studies regarding that. But on one hand, one grooming news is that bioplastics are not necessarily safe. And it has proven by some papers and studies. Usually, bioplastics are cellulose, which is biodegradable. Of course, you can make it out of corn, potatoes, but corn is the cheapest one. So with corn, they make a lot of things. Using that materials and business can create products, but to produce products, they need uh, additives should be added. So when a product is being developed, those materials and chemicals are fragmented and they can be released by products and there's no natural uh, they, they use natural we use natural fiber but anyway natural fibers affect Daphnia magna as well and physical properties so particle toxicity can be found so particle toxicity is owned by such materials. It means that physical toxicity is can, uh, can be found as well. Of course, there are circular plastics, but some are fragmented. And microfiber plastics and film plastics are found in our nature. When we eat them, it may uh, it could physically damage our organs and body you can see daphnia galeata and you can see the inside of it you can find the yellow arrow it shows dying materials are coming out of it it shows that its gut are damaged by microplastics, so dying materials are coming out from damaged guts. And I just showed water flea, but other than that, microplastics are released from many living creatures, so microplastics cause natural damage to living creatures. And you can see microvillus are exposed to microplastics. When they are exposed to mi microplastics, they are becoming thinner and shorter. And next is the impact of microplastics on the gut of brine shrimp. I don't have much time left, so I will skip this slide. And we can see the guts of the shrimp was also damaged by microplastics. Let's go back to traffic transfer. So the reason why I'm showing this is that we carried out, we studied four chains. So traffic transfer, to do traffic transfer, it's hard to with three chains, but we recently succeeded with four chains. So water flea, small, from water flea to smaller water flea, some materials were transferred. And we see dark chub. So even those materials can be transferred into dark chub, which is very small living creature. And if you analyze it inside the body, you can see microplastics in those living organisms. And this study is done by research team, a research team in the UK, and it was covered a lot. So it studies whether traffic transfer is happening or not. And at this time, just like other materials, microplastics can be transferred through our food chain so that we can, we may eat this microplastic unconsciously. And we have talked a lot about zero plastic and no plastics as well. But 
we, as I mentioned before, we are called homo plasticus. Without plastic, do you think we can live in a normal life? So a shift, a transformation toward with plastic era should be the one we need to think about. Recycle, reuse, and ESG-based efforts, they should be integrated. So we need to make sure to minimize the volume of plastics used and we need to live in the era of rich plastic. So with this, I'd like to conclude my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please give her another round of warm applause. So she talked about the underwater marine ecosystem and toxicity onto the micro organisms and uh, living creatures on the water. Next presentation will be given by Mr. Kim Jin Su from KRRAMS. He's going to talk about the biodistribution evaluation of the impact of microplastics. Dr. Kim is working for KIRAMS and also he is the principal researcher for UST and the oncology genetic study is some of the areas of his expertise. Please welcome with a big round of applause. Greetings, I'm from KIRAMS. My name is Kim Jin Soo and it is my great pleasure to be invited to the forum. The topic I'm going to speak today is the biodistribution and impact evaluation of microplastics. The previous two speakers talked about the microplastics and its environmental impact. We are not free or immune to microplastic effect. So what impact will it make on our human bodies? The exposure of microplastics within our human body cannot be directly measured. So instead, we decided to use the animal model. Microplastics and in vivo biodistribution has been analyzed through mouse model. So the title is in vivo biodistribution, and this biodistribution refers to the indigestion of the microplastic and distribution and the excretion of it. We use the PET devices and the isotopic devices as well to do the analysis. So I have three main topics. First is a biodistribution of microplastics through PET and isotopic devices. So biodistribution map was made and based on this map, I tried to understand the microplastics distribution and after such evaluation, we tracked and followed the behaviors of microplastics. And second, microplastics might enter into the brain. So if it really migrate into the brain, what effect will it make? And that was the second topic. And third topic is that microplastics also can interact with gut. And what will happen with that interaction? I have so many slides, and uh, I think some of them are or something you have already seen. We are living in a world where we are exposed to microplastics, and even in the oceans, a lot of microplastics have been detected. And actually, previous speaker also talked that within, because of the food chain effect, food plastics can also can enter into the human bodies for sure and indirect evidences have been collected. If you, you go to the fishery in Korea, oysters also hold some amount of the microplastics as well. So those plastic polluted seafood are consumed by, by human, body, uh, human beings and what will happen? If you go to San Francisco, crumb chowder is a common food you can meet. And it, a little bit exaggeration, the clam chowder spoon can be tantamount to the plastic soup because clam and seashells are already polluted with plastics much. So based on such evidences, what kind of effect will plastics will make on our human body through what mechanism of action? And based on such analysis, what kind of impact we will make on our human brains or stomach? So those were the topics of my research. Of course, the exposure of microplastic happened in three main ways. First, 
the oysters were selfish are eaten by human beings and through the stomachs they are ingested. So oral intake is the first channel of ingestion. And second, the microplastics in the air can be inhaled or they can penetrate into human skins as well. So subcutaneous ingestion would be the second channel. So oral intake, the first one would be the pre-consumption of my study among three. So this first paper was published by my research team on the tracing of microdistribution of orally administered orally administered PET. So by using PET device, we look into the microplastics taken orally to see how it is excreted from human body by using animal model. The technology we employ is the PET scan technology or positron emission tomography, which is commonly used in hospitals. They are used for oncology purpose when cancer is created and made. Those kind of uh, cancer related uh, metastasis and creation can be all tracked with PET because PET can detect gamma ray in 180-degree radius. So microplastic isotopic traces can be tracked with PET, and that absorption might not be tracked accurately, but isotopic markers onto the microplastics can be tracked with a PET device. One big merit is that we can accurately track and trace the isotopic stained plastics as long as the half-life remains. On the left side, you can see the polyethylene stained with the isotopic marker. And one hour, 30 minutes later, we detected the movement of microplastics. The picture on the bottom is the movement of the PS after the mouse orally intake the microplastics on up until the excretion. On the bottom, the line, the white line, represent the bone of a mouth, and red, blue, and other color areas are the isotopic marked area that tells the pathway of excretion. For a full day, the microplastic stays inside the stomach, and two days later, or 48 hours, 48 hours later, everything is excreted, but metastasis happens in the liver. So it turns out that it stays at least a day within the stomach and uh, the gut for a day. But Stomach, liver were the only organ we were able to observe, but we had other curiosity. What will happen in other organs as well? To dispel this curiosity, we uh, kind of biopsed, biopsed all the mouse models, and after an hour, it turns out the microplastics were distributed all across the mouse body. Through PET image analysis, as you can see on the top, liver, gut, brain, and uh, the blood, and also the reproductive organs were affected by microplastics as well. These studies tell that microplastics, in case of mouse model, within an hour are distributed all across the body, and it stays within the stomach for 24 hours. Of course, this is a limited study because it was done for mouse model, but nothing would be much different in human body as well. Nano micro size. Uh, plastics. If the size is smaller, the distribution will happen faster, and it also affects the blood. So it will be circulated all the way through the veins and reproductive organs as well. So these data tells that human body, of course it was the mass model, but I can say that human bodies can be hugely affected by the plastics, especially microplastics, for quite a long if the exposure is ample enough, exposure time is ample enough. Based on such study, we did the second round of the study. To give you the conclusion first, microplastics can also cause autism. 
or autism spectrum disorder. In the recent study, actually one character had an autism spectrum disorder. The character was a lawyer, and that lawyer was suffering from this autism spectrum disorder. Autism spectrum disorder, as this drama tells, uh, causes some kind of obsession or repeated patterns. So my question was that whether microplastic can be one of the risk factors for such autism. According to the US CDC data, it tells that over the last two decades, the incidence of the autism increased significantly. Of course, this is a US data, and that does not tell us that the same will happen in Korea. But we can assume that there is ample evidence that the same phenomenon might happen in Korea. Of course, there could be other environmental factors as well. But I can still say that since we are living in the plastic age, because of the environmental pollution, that pollution will affect the human beings and the incident of autism or other brain disease can also increase as well due to the plastic pollution. So I did a study like that. Actually, when I did this study, I limit. I did not limit my study to autism. I just look into the interaction between microplastics and brain of human beings. That was the first curiosity I had. And if you see this next slide, at the beginning, like I said, I didn't specify that this study is for autism. I just made exposure and did multiple experiment. Microplastics. Uh, entry into brain was analysis, analyzed, and the gene level changes and uh, microorganism inside the gut were analyzed. Also, I did a molecule analysis to understand the molecule act and the glucose uh, metabol metabolism related changes. So inside my hospital, I work with the pediatricians to understand what kind of disease can be caused by microplastics. And it turns out that they can affect autism or quite high, with a high possibility. So we did two kinds of study, actually. The first is prenatal disposure, and second is postnatal disposure. For prenatal disposure, when plastic is exposed to the mother with a pregnancy, what will happen onto the baby? And postnatal exposure means that during the peri, natal and postnatal period, what exposure will happen? Actually, autism clinically happens because of the perinatal expo not because of the perinatal disposal or postnatal disposal, but since this is a mouse model, we did it anyway. To conclude, we had a strong evidence that when exposure happened in pregnant mother, the baby can be affected as well in terms of the development of autism. To say, in other words, the repeated pattern and obsession, which is a common symptoms of autism, can be seen as well. Like the lawyer inside the drama, he actually shows quite smart. So clinically, this kind of symptoms can be developed. So inside the mass model, the repeated patterns and obsession and the cognitive disappear uh, can be observed, could be observed. And it turns out that the microplastic exposure can cause autism as well. So polyethylene was used for my study, and 10 micrograms were injected orally to mouse. And this dosage is same to a around 76 milligram for a human being whose weight is 60 kilogram. So we use a uh, any uh, we use the prenatal mo mouth model, like I said, and so the impact of the microplastic ingestion of a mother in onto the baby all the way down to the adolescent period. And in terms of the surprisingly, the impact of microplastic onto brain were found. Actually, it was stuck inside the brain. On the right top side, you can see the particles of plastic in green. So inside the brain, there was a pieces of microplastics. So the first, the size of the plastic at the beginning was 20 micrometer, but the size of the plastic stuck in the brain was between three and four micrometer. Actually, this kind of observation were found in other studies as well. As I said in the previous paper, when gut is exposed microplastics, it stays inside the gut for 24 hours. 
and those in within 24 hours, everything are broken into pieces and circulated into the blood vein. And some of them, very small, nanoplastics, goes inside the brain and stuck inside the brain. And some events might occur because of that microplastic. So we confirmed that the stuck in the brain, but what kind of change will happen inside the gut? In the stomach, there are microorganisms, and particularly the number of microorganisms inside the gut increased in some parts. When compared to the normal gut, we did a comparison, and indirectly, we were able to understand the changes inside the gut. And it, the changes inside the microbiome inside the gut clearly could affect the autism development. We use the MR devices, which is also used for clinical purpose. So we look into the hippocampus as well as the frontal lobe to understand the decision-making related capabilities of the brain. And we were able to understand the changes in the metabolite, which also affect the development of autism. And this is the also this is the molecule images of the body. And this tells the changes in glucose. When microplastics are eaten, the glucose metabolism might change we expected. And it turns out that at the free, free, free frontal love, the glucose digestion level decreased. And this suggests that working memory. Let's say that when you take a bus and see some kind of font number, and uh, whether you remember or not is affected by this free frontal love metabolism and that working level memory decreased or impaired because of the ingestion. So if the exposure happens for quite a long inside a mother body, that also affects the brain of a baby. So what would be the main causes of such development? So we look into inside the gene of the brain of a human uh, I mean the brain, and the one biggest difference. Actually, there was a three biggest difference in at the gene level. EGR1 was the first one, and the remaining two were changed as well. And those three gene level genes expression level increased significantly. Actually, the expression of those three are common expression level we can see in the case of autism patients. So what we were able to know was that the microplastics can be found inside the brain when ingested, and also microbiome inside the gut can change due to uh, microplastic exposure. And those two do affect the development of autism because the microbiome inside those gut were similar to the microbiome inside a patient with autism. Of course, the cytokine secreted by cells were detected as well. And that kind of cytokine is also a common symptom of a patient with autism. Such things are kind of indirect evidences, but what about direct evidence, change of behavior? If you see this, this is a prenatal model of uh, uh, autism-like traits model. I use the term ASD like because this is not the human model, but uh, animal model. So I kind of toned it down a little bit. And this tells the decreased social kind of behaviors. When uh, the microplastic is ex exposed to mother, that baby born from that mother has lower social capabilities. Also, repetitive and obsessive patterns increased as well. So let's say that if I give a bees, the mouse trying to dig into the bees continuously with uh, repetitive patterns. And that is one big symptom of autism. Repetitive and obsessive behaviors were found inside a baby born from a mother who were, uh, which were exposed to microplastics. So through the adolescent model, everything were observed uh, likewise. So exposure of the microplastic to mother do affect the development of autism of a baby mouth, we concluded. Of course, this is just a mouse model, and the dosage was quite high. But 
throughout the life, we are exposed to huge amount of microplastics. And baby born from mother with such exposure surely could be affected, and we can imagine it. And this mouse model tells that the exposure to microplastics can be a one risk factor of the development of autism. And I was able to confirm it through mouse model. The third research, if those two are the truth, if the ingestion happens continuously, I was wondering whether they will stay, stay within the stomach continuously or what will happen for a long period of time. And as you can see here, the title was that the, the, the tolerance uh, level of the microplastics with the, to the patient with the stomach cancer. And as you can see in the previous uh, page, when exposure happens for 24 hours, it stays within the gut, like I said. Of course, in case of the human beings, when something is eaten, the food usually stays for four to five hours inside the stomach. So the, the metabolism is a little, a little bit different between the two species. But what will happen if the, if the exposure happens for long throughout the life? As you can see here, uh, the food and microplastics stayed inside the uh, stomach for 24 hours. And those microplastics might interact with other organs or body systems. To conclude first, it aggravated uh, cancer development, stomach cancer. In, uh, according to other studies we conducted, those plastics are very much carcinogenic. However, that was not confirmed fully. But we at least can tell that the aggravation do happen. When we talk about cancer, the marker of cancer can be found through metastasis and the uh, evasion of the immune system. And also, we this is quite a technical one. However, the evasion of immune system and CDRE means the resistance to the cancer therapy. This means that when patients with cancer are administered with a target therapy, usually that cancer therapy do work well. But because of the exposure to microplastics, the dosage of that target therapy must increase. This means that the resistance inside of the human body increases because of the microplastics. So it is very difficult to treat the cancer unless the dosage is increased as well. So this first picture tells that on the st stomach wall, microplastics were found likewise. And the exposure continued, and it turns out that the cancer grew faster than the mouse without microplastic exposure. And metastasis happens. This metastasis tells that, let's say that you have a cancer inside the liver. And a year later, it is metastasis to stomach. That kind of metastasis were observed. So due to the prolongation of the microplastic exposure, Stomach cancer can cause the liver cancer. That kind of metastasis can happen. Also, resistance to uh, P, uh, the resistance to the therapy can happen. PDL1 is the gene expression that tells the level of evasion of immune system. And cancer system kind of pretend that it is uh, normal cells when they are encountered with immune cells. So if P were PDL1 level increases, the evasion level of immune system of cancer cells increases as well. And that was confirmed in the mouse model because this study tells that exposure to microplastics uh, decrease the survival rate, which means that the mouse with cancer die faster. Also, through mouse model, the resistance to treatment increased as well. To repeat once again, they develop a certain resistance to specific uh, therapies and higher dosage is required to treat the cancer. And metastasis marker were observed as well. So these studies were the foundation of the follow-up study. What kind of gene has uh, correlations with that kind of microplastic? We did a gene analysis, and it turns out that EDCL2 was the gene that has correlations. So through the gene analysis, ALS2 were found whose exploration level was higher due to microplastic uh, exposure. Those two genes were the genes that aggravate the cancer development. To conclude, microbe 
did a study on microplastic exposure, we were not able to test with the human body. So we did it that kind of in vivo study with the mouse model to understand the ingestion of microplastic. And the first conclusion we found was that it can be a risk factor, possible risk factor for autism. Second, it can aggravate the cancer development, I mean, stomach cancer. And since, uh, although it was a mouse model, I believe that it can cause the human body's cancer development as well. Also, we did an oral ingestion, but the microplastic can be inhaled as well. And uh, ingestion and excretion of inhalement was made. Also, the skin permeation of the microplastic were studied as well. Through those studies, I believe the microplastics, we are living in a time of plastic age. So no one is immune to this kind of exposure, to tell the truth. If that's the case in such environment, what kind of impact will plastic make onto our human body? And I was able to look into some of it through this kind of mass model. Thank you so much for your kind of listening. Thank you very much for your presentation, Dr. Kim. Once again, please give him a big hand. So the flow intake of microplastics and the correlation with autistic spectrum disease. He shared its, uh, his research studies and results of them. And next, Professor Kim Sung-gyu of Incheon National University will deliver his presentation. Now he's working at Incheon National University, and he studied the flow of microplastics in the Arctic areas and Antarctic areas. And I'd like to ask you, to not to take photos or record it since his materials are confidential, confidential. So please refrain from reusing it or reproducing it or distributing it. So under the theme of microplastic pollution of marine environment and wildlife near Jeju Island, he's going to deliver his presentation.
And one thing I don't, I was not able to understand that you are such an excellent speaker, and I don't understand why you said so at the beginning of your presentation. Let me move on to the panel discussion session from now on. And like I said before, the panel discussion will be joined by another panelist member from India, from IIT, Mr. Brajesh Davi, Associate Professor. Are you connected? Dr. Brajesh Davi, are you connected? Dr. Brajesh Davi? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, uh, I can see your face. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing good. Nice to see you. Well, uh, can you uh, give a short introduction on your uh, yourself and your research area mm -hmm. in terms of uh, plastic pollution? Sure. So I'm uh, Rajesh Dube. I work in the area of waste management, sustainability, circular economy. Uh, those are my research area. And for last, uh, uh, I would say, uh, five, six years, uh, I have been focusing on plastic pollution, uh, some research related to plastic pollution in India. We had a project uh, funded through National Geographic Society USA, where we looked into uh, leakages from the land system. So we are more focused on the land, uh, not that much in the water, uh, but the like, movement of plastic from the land to the water. So looking at the mismanaged municipal solid waste, plastic from the municipal solid waste leaking into the river. So that's what uh, we tried to quantify along the river Ganges. As you probably know, that river Ganges is one of the major river we have in India. So we had looked into along the river Ganges, we, we did for around 14, 15 cities, and we tried to quantify. We also looked at the litter uh, there as well. And presently, we also have a project where we are trying to produce bioplastic from food waste. So look, we're looking at the food waste, a more sustainable way of uh, uh, making plastic. And then I, I, I did participate in some other uh, uh, activities of the World Resource Institute. Again, another project of National Geographic Society, all like as looking at trying to come up with a better way of managing plastic. So that's kind of uh, very briefly, that's what I have been involved in. Oh, OK, thank you for your introduction. And uh, uh, have you? Uh, uh, are you enjoying this uh, 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 session uh, on the uh, microplastic risk on human health and ecosystem? And do, do you have any question uh, to any speakers uh, who present? Yeah, so one question I had was that uh, in terms of, uh, I looked at all the presentations, the very nice uh, uh, presentations and also a lot of good papers which uh, I could see. Uh, coming uh, in those presentations. Uh, but one question I had in terms of when we analyze this uh, uh, microplastic impact on different species, uh, many times what we do is we just look at in the juvenile range. We don't look at the matured uh, species. So how, how the result will change if we, when I look at the microplastic uh, exposure uh, to different species, how the, uh, the impact will change as the species is aging. So if, if any, any one of them uh, if want to kind of comment on that, that was just one of the curiosity I had while going through the presentation. So your question to whom? That, uh, can you, can you uh, mention uh, uh, first or second or third uh, speaker? Uh, I think the second, second presenter. Uh, 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 second speakers. Uh, yes, Professor An, uh, if you uh, hear the question, can, uh, can you answer the question? Uh, should I repeat? Yes. Hi, thanks for the joining this the discussion. Uh, so you ask, you know, how the microplastic affect the different species, right? Yeah, so my question was that see most of the laboratory this studies the exposure organism to one type of microplastic of a specific size, polymer and shape, and uh, and then also for a one particular age group. So in, in the natural environment they will have mixture of microplastic with different resin type, different size, different shape. And, and as they age also, the species will age, how, how the impact will differ? Do you have? Because that's to kind of get a holistic picture of the risk. 
I think this is very important point, but we don't have the sufficient data to explain the yeah. whole of the things. Okay. So now we know that the microplastic affect different species at a different trophy level. And most of the study focused on the, the small the, the species in the environment. Because to study the ecotoxicity, we use the standard species, for example, in the water system, Daphnia magna, or the algae, or the small fishes are the representative of the ecotoxicity species. So we know the, their effect. And then also we know there's some effect among the, the some population. However, we don't know about the community effect. So our goal is to know how the microplastic effect the whole ecosystem. I think that should be our goal, but now the research is just to stay on the small, you know, the area. So to know the interaction between the species and species, I think we know something, but we still don't know how the microplastic affect diversity of the species. I have the small question for you. So, so India, uh, is there the, any regulation for microplastic the, the policy or? Uh, right now, no. Uh, we don't have uh, any uh, specific regulations for microplastic as of now. Uh, there is, uh, in fact, uh, if you look at if, if you look at the, even the standard methods, uh, there is no as far as for the any uh, guideline is also not there in terms of uh, uh, how to do put a sampling standard or analysis is standard, of course, we are all working on that. But yeah, there is no uh, regulations on microplastics yet. Uh, we do have regulations on uh, macro plastic in terms of uh, thickness of the, poly of the plastic carrying bags, anything which is more than 120 microns is only allowed now. Uh, anything below 120 microns is not allowed. Uh, but we know that this is only one source of microplastic. Microplastic can come from other sources of microplastics too when they, uh, they break down into the environment. But right now we don't have any standard in terms of, uh, I think basically we don't, we haven't done enough research to come up with those standard. Uh, that's what I would say. Okay, because the from the news, I saw, you know, some the, you know, the, some event in India, such as the, the bird are suffering from the microplastic, the no, plastic ring, they have the ring on their the mouth and they cannot open the mouth and they die by the mm -hmm. starving. So I'm just wondering, yeah. you know, what happened in India. Thank you. Yeah, so we do have, there is a marine litter policy is there, uh, which is kind of, uh, again, kind of taken with the UN, uh, the UN's environmental goal of the Clean Seas campaign. And then the government has come up with uh, uh, national marine litter policy, but the, again, uh, the, the, like in terms of what you asked earlier, we don't have any microplastic policy. Okay, thank you, Dubey. Uh, and from the floor, any questions? If you have any questions, please raise your hand. We are going to take one or two questions from the floor. Any questions from online participants? If there's no question, then I'm going to proceed. So I'd like to ask a question to Dr. Kim. So the size of the microplastic vary and the impact of the microplastic can vary as well depending on size of plastics. But recently, if you see the system that look into the air quality, like fine dust, 2.5 or 1.5 nanometer fine dust are analyzed and alert system is made according to the size of fine dust particles. So maybe, don't you think that we need to look into the differences of the microplastics by size, standardize the toxicity or impact of the microplastic by size. Don't you think that we need it? Micro-sized plastic and nano-sized plastics are different in terms of toxicity. I do believe that there will be a difference in terms of toxicity. And Mr. Jung would know better than me, but nano-plastic would have higher toxicity than microplastic, I believe, on human body. 
Uh, and of course, uh, there should be some standards, but when it comes to micro sized plastic and nano sized plastic, the distinction must be clearly made to begin with because I'm also interested in it as well. Micro sized plastic biodistribution and map of the micro distribution within the body has been studied by my research team, but Nano plastic has been commonly used instead of the microplastic. So that's why I use the PET device to understand the ingestion, indigestion and distribution of nanoplastics. And also we look into the microplastic that penetrate into the skin subcutaneously. Or I, I believe that that kind of penetration is very limited when it comes to microplastics, but nanoplastics can easily go into the skin and observed. Uh, we assumed. So I believe that the relevant studies will be done continuously, I believe, in the future forward. Thank you very much for sharing your ideas and thoughts. So among speakers, do you have any questions to one another? If you have one, it's OK to go ahead. If you don't have any questions, I'd like to ask a question to Professor Seung Yu Kim. OK, please go ahead. Water is circulating in the ocean, right? In the ocean, water is circulating continuously, right? Then microplastics are accumulated in the two poles. So regarding that, I did in-depth discussion in my paper. Indeed, there are many papers regarding Arctic, the Arctic. But usually it focuses on the west area and Northwest Pacific area. From that area, sea flows to the Arctic. And from Bering Sea, it also sea currents comes to the Arctic. If you look at the amount of sea current, so the Atlantic Sea is much more than the Bering Sea. Then why is it, is it important in this area? And there is a reflux in the Arctic and this reflux is leaving Arctic, but it is prevented from leaving out from Arctic by some sea currents. And in summer, some ices are melted and it is expanded to the Bering Sea. So when ice is melting and frozen again and again, then microplastics are accumulated. So these two processes are overlapped. So that's why microplastics are estimated to be accumulated in the Arctic. And the amount of like, accumulated is far more in far much more in this western area than eastern area of the Arctic. So today we are holding Jeju Plus International Environment Forum under the theme of plastic and biodiversity. So I'd like to ask a question to Professor Chung or Pl Professor An. Microplastics, what kind of impacts does microplastic have on biodiversity? Could you briefly elaborate it? So the theme of the forum is plastic and biodiversity, as you mentioned. So what kind of impact of microplastics have on the biodiversity is a question you may have. Indeed, microplastics have an impact on biodiversity, but other than microplastics, there are so many pollutants. Of course, we are talking about microplastics today, but microplastics is uh, just part of other pollutants. And it is a cocktail. Microplastics is a cocktail that contains a lot of pollutants mixed, and plastics are created by synthesizing polymers, and we need a lot of raw materials, and a lot of hazardous chemicals are used to create physical properties of plastics. So that is why plast when plastics are fragmented, chemicals are also leaked to the nature. Of course, as I mentioned, we are talking about microplastics, but I believe we are also talking about all chemicals, including environmental hormones. 
That's why rather than connecting plastics, only plastics with biodiversity, we need to think about biodiversity with other pollutants as well as plastics. And one more point, microplastics are polymers and we should not see it is the only problem of polymers. Of course, all products need polymers and other pollutants as well. So all materials we know have chemical polymers and plastic polymers. So we need to think those polymers at the same time as well. So when a disease occurs, of course, plastics may have a heavy impact on the disease. But rather than thinking plastics is the only one that is the main culprit of it, but we need to look at and uh, look inside of the plastics. And we carried out a research recently. So the outer sole of shoes create microplastics continuously. And we analyzed the outer sole of shoes. And I'm not sure it's right to pick only one material. Anyway, we found one material. And if that material is not necessarily needed to create shoes, and if we find an alternative to that material, then we will be able to improve. So going back to biodiversity. So let me give you an example. Some papers show that plastics and microplastics are changing some characteristics of species. So some portion of species could be changed by some plastic pollution. And inside the food web, if one species is vulnerable or exposed to risks, then the total food chain could be exposed to risks and change. But we have no idea what will happen in the future. That is the most scary part. Scary part. Please allow me to add some comments. So we are talking about the impact of microplastics on living organisms like uh, human bodies and that kind of stu study should be seen more accurately because there's a difference between the impact on the living creature and impact on human body. You talked about the PEE and its impact on human bodies and actually uh, like she just said uh, those plastics are a mixture of multiple uh, substances so when we do the experiment, we need to study multiple types of the product, but it's very difficult to look into all those different types of the products. So the result of the study cannot be just taken as it is. We need more studies at the lab level to understand the differences of the multiple types of the plastics. Also, impact of different kinds of plastics must be understood one by one, and the distinction between each type must be understood as well. Thank you so much for your answer. Since we use up almost all time, I think we need to wrap up the session here. And Mr. Bright, Brad Jesse Davi, do you have any take home message you want to share with as a last wrap up message? Yeah, so just to continue on uh, what was just being discussed, uh, when we talk about uh, this, this plastic pollution has given us uh, an opportunity to look at uh, uh, contamination happening in the ocean. Uh, in fact, uh, the World Resource Institute has uh, come up with a lot of blue papers recently, where one of the paper was looking at uh, what we can do with plastic pollution, uh, what we can do with ocean pollution in the context of plastic pollution. So. Uh, in the ocean, as was mentioned just now, plastic is just one of the contaminants. There are a variety of contaminants coming from municipal activities, industrial activities, activities happening within the ocean itself. And all those, uh, and along with the cocktail of plastic, is creating a, a big problem, big challenge uh, for us. In terms of the microplastics, it's still uh, it's early days, the microplastic, nanoplastic, we, uh, we have to learn a lot. We have a lot of good research is happening. And uh, in India, in Indian context, if you are, if I want to add, uh, in the Indian Academia as well, a lot of work is going on, mostly focused more on uh, terrestrial environment, uh, not that much on the marine environment yet, but mostly from the terrestrial environment, sorry, in the marine environment, not much in the terrestrial environment yet, uh, but uh, there is a uh, work going on in India, and uh, if you may have heard that Indian government actually banned certain uh, single-use plastic very recently. Uh, it was banned earlier, but during COVID it was kind of uh, taken back, but again it is banned, and hopefully that will help improve our situation a little bit. So that's what I would like to say. Thank you, Dubey. So I thought he understood Korean. 
since we asked, we didn't ask a question. So anyway, there have been so many studies going on in the academia and in the many areas. A lot of data, huge amount of data has been accumulated to see how impactful a plastic is on biodiversity. But we have a long way to go in the future. Anyway, thank you very much for four speakers and one online participant, Dr. Davi, Rajesh Davi. So thank you very much for your presence. And with this, we'd like to conclude this session. Thank you very much. So with this, we'd like to conclude uh, session five under the theme of risks of microplastics, recent studies regarding impact on human and ecosystem. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, please give them a big hand to all the participants and speakers and panelists. Thank you. At the lobby, we have prepared coffee and light refreshments. Please use your own tumbler so that you can be a part of Plastic Free Campaign. And then we will be back at 4.20 for session six. Thank you.